That's how you leave and have fun. I, I'd, go, I'd go with her too. Do you have questions about prayer? Do you know how to pray? Do you ever feel the tension of even what to say? Maybe for prayer, it's complicated. Or maybe prayer's just awkward. Now, I've got to tell you, when I see and, and think of the word awkward, I think of Bobby Hahn. Yeah, there's a story behind it. I mean, if you looked at him uh, just now, uh, when I said and called out his name, I asked him in advance. Uh, when, when I called him out a while ago, I mean, he's like Mr. Extrovert, you know, and so he's like, hi, it's me, uh, and, and stuff like that. One of the times that we were just eating together after church one, one day, a bunch of us were at McAllister's, and so we get done. And uh, there's an attendant that comes to the table. We're just talking. Uh, it's been a you know, great day at church, and we've got cleaned up and uh, everything. And we, we finish eating, and an attendant comes to the table and says, can I, get, uh, can I gather your trays? Are you finished with your dishes and things like that? Bobby, in an animated voice, says, you can have it all! And it was like everybody in the room looked at him. <laughs> and Bobby didn't handle it quite that way that day. This particular day, I think it was the eyebrow of his loving wife. And he kind of felt the pressure, and he kind of did one of those turtle back in your shells type moments. And he makes it better by turning around to everybody and goes, Hi, I'm awkward. <laughs> and I laughed, and I laughed, and I laughed. and I, I mean, so anytime I see the word awkward, I mean, I think of Bobby Hunt uh, on that. Maybe when you think of prayer, it's awkward. Maybe when you think of prayer, it's just something you do for a little while, and then when things get good or they level out, you just stop. Uh, maybe for prayer, uh, for you, you're wondering how everybody else seems to do it and respond so seamlessly, and you seem to have to work at it. Uh, and it just, just doesn't come natural, and you're like, you know, maybe there's something more to this that I can't seem to figure out. Do you ever wonder what it's like to pray right in the middle of your life, right with all your circumstances and all your feelings and all the reactions of life that's going on, and just be consistently coming back to God and engaging and connecting with Him in prayer? Wouldn't that be great? Here's, here's what I want to lean in and tell you just to start off. We all have questions about prayer. We all do. And the beauty is that we can gather together, we can go to God's Word, and the Holy Spirit, inspired Word of God, can be our guide to actually strengthen us uh, in the power of His might and strengthen and develop us in prayer. And so that's what we're going to be talking about over the next coming weeks. And I'm going to begin today by talking about a, a, a parable, a story of Jesus that may be be his most famous parable, the, the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, and just to give you some setup for that, Jesus was actually talking to a group of people that would call themselves outsiders. He was talking to the tax collectors and the sinners. And, and you could just see, uh, it's like some people were over to the side just kind of going, I mean, giving them one of those. And so you can kind of, there's some tenseness uh, to the situation. But Jesus is talking to uh, and sitting among these, these uh, that would be called tax collectors uh, and sinners. Uh, and they would be ones that you really wouldn't want to associate with. Uh, or your, your reputation is going to kind of be tarnished a little bit. Uh, and, and so, you know, this would have been, you know, why is, is Jesus even sitting amongst them? Uh, and the Pharisees, those, the teachers of the law, those that prided themselves for doing the right things the right way at the right time, they were sitting over there and they were having one of these conversations like, Psst. <laughs> Jesus is over there. Does he realize who he's around? Does he realize who he's talking? Do you, does he realize who uh, they are? Does he realize I saw their picture, you know, uh, in not a good place, you know, and I, and I see them on. And, and, and he's, he's feeling the tension uh, of, of all this that's, that's going on. And Jesus decides to lean in and share a picture of the heart of God. 
And he does this through a story. He does this through a story, and he wants us to make sure and get the heart of God. Now, as we look through this, it's easy for us to look at this story, and if, if I could say so, to westernize the story. And we miss so many of the juicy, wonderful, beautiful details that, that Jesus was trying to make sure and get all different folks that were listening to hear about what? The heart of God for me and for you. Uh, and so I, wa- I don't want you just to go, man, that would make a great movie. You know, somebody was down on their luck uh, and, and they got life together. Woo, that's a great movie. No, 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 no. Don't focus so much on that. Focus on what Jesus was trying to show and to tell us about the heart of God. See, yes, this is a beautiful story about grace and forgiveness and mercy. But I believe today God wants to share with us some insights into his heart on prayer. So if you'd like, turn to Luke chapter 15, uh, beginning in verse 11, actually shows and tells us uh, the parable of the prodigal son. It's a spiritual uh, story about a man who had how many sons? Two. It, that was just a, an extra added title when we're talking about prodigal son. Why? Because it was somebody that uh, got all they could and they went off and essentially they were a, splend, a spend thrift. They, they just went out and just wasted uh, money. They, they spent uh, everything that they could uh, and on their own stuff and just kind of wasted things. And so that's what prodigal means, and it, it just kind of stuck with that. But it's really a powerful story, uh, so much depth to it. Now, as part of this story, I need you to help me out because this story has so much drama to it. I'm going to need some help with that. So there's going to be some parts that even as they were listening to this story, some people would have gone, (gasps) I mean, you know, one of those big, just like the air would have been pulled out of the room. So I'm going to need some help here various times through the story. Okay, so I'm going to give you a one, two, three, and you're going to give me one of those, you know, terrible gasps. I mean, just, I mean, I need to see it and feel it on your face. I need the oxygen sucked out of the room so that we totally grasp and get into what they were doing to the story. So I'm going to give you a little practice here. So I'll go one, two, three, and you give me this. Okay, all right, here we go. One, two, three. Okay, that was beautiful. Okay, and, and so they start off the story. And as the story goes, there were two sons and his father. The younger of the two sons came to his father and he asked for his portion of the inheritance. Now, now to wrap our minds around this, this would be like going to your dad and going, Dad, I want your stuff. I don't care if you're dead. One, two, three. I mean, yeah, it would have been like completely, you're like, sicko, you know, what is this guy? I mean, can you believe? I mean, his own, I mean, yeah, he was wanting to get everything that he could out of it. Now, to, to understand this parable set up well, in that day, if you did that, if you dissed your dad, oh man, you were, you were in trouble. Your dad had the authority to, most of the time, they would backslap you. Uh, they would tell you just to, dads are like, no, better not now. Uh, uh, most of the time, they would backslap you. They, would, they could, could completely remove you from the family. They might even have a funeral that you're dead to me. I mean, and the whole community was in on this. I mean, this was like, if you did this to your dad, I mean, it was like so terrible for even making the request. The dad would have been completely embarrassed. The dad would have been completely heartbroken. The dad would have garnered the support of the community for his spooled, deadbeat, rotten son. Wow. What does this father do? He says, I'm going to give you your portion. One, two, three. I mean, come on. I mean, really, I, I don't know about, if I were to call my dad and said, Dad, I wish you were dead. Give me all the money I can get out of it. I mean, I'm not going to live very long. I mean, that, that's what this guy did. And then somehow in this story, remember, remember, we're looking for the heart of God in the story. But the father says, I'm going to give it to you. And so as the custom of the day, there were two sons. The older son would have gotten two-thirds majority. The younger would have gotten a third. And so he cashed in. And this obviously was a very wealthy man. He cashed in his land, his portion, 
and the younger son turned it all to cash and he left the country. I mean, I mean, the family, the rest, everybody would have gone. Really? I mean, I, I, you know, I thought he was joking. And I, I thought his dad was going to get him and, and doing all this. And, and, and really, he, he did all that and he, and he left? Why did he do that? I mean, let's just crawl into his mind. Why did he do that? Like lots of us, he thought he could do it better than anybody else. He thought his way was better and that he should make his own choices. He thought that maybe his father's way was a little antiquated and that he should do it his way. In fact, I bet you across his lips, he probably went, I should make my own choices. In fact, if you want to be a part of my life, you should do it on my own terms. You go, that dirty dog. Yet, we've done the same thing to God in prayer, haven't we? God, I'll do it my way. God, I'll make my own choices. God, I'll go and be a part of this. I'll engage in your word. I'll talk to you in prayer. I'll go to church. I'll do whatever on my terms when it's convenient. I'll engage with you, but right now, I got it figured out. And so, I'm going to keep you at arm's length. Haven't we all done that? As the story unfolds, the son wastes all of his money. He wastes all of his money on wild living. I mean, and again, Jesus is telling us a story about the heart of God, and he's showing us, I mean, he's giving us the very extreme. And so this guy, anything you can think of, did he go do? He did. In fact, he got so broke. Oh, no, you got to help me out. How broke was he? Okay. So he got so broke. He was so broke he couldn't pay attention. Thank you. Hi, I'm awkward. <laughs> fist bump, air fist bump. <laughs> How about I turn to the scripture? That would be a good idea. Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 11, and we get in on the story. And so, I'm starting in verse 17. Starting in verse 17. Talking about the son. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here in hunger. I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he rose and he went to his father. How many times have we done that in prayer? I'm going to pray, but let me get it all worked out first. And so we rehearse, you know what I'm saying? We were like, you know, oh, Father, I mean, we, you know, we kind of go through the things, or maybe you, you default, and, 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 and not that these are wrong, but maybe you default and you go to a certain formula, and then you, so you can check it off, or, you know, you just do it because it's, the time, you know, it's time to eat or time to go to bed. And so it's, it's, it's more about a checkoff box, and you're worried about what to say, and then you kind of get, you know, conscientious about, well, what everybody's listening to me, and then am I going to mess it up? And, and we get so worried about what to say, and, then, and, and I, I feel that in, in in this guy, uh, and, and that's what he's doing. And I want you to see, and I want you to hear, and I want you to wrap your mind around this morning the response of the Father in Scripture. But while he was still a long way off, this isn't a look through the blinds type way off. This is probably crawl on top of the city wall and see somebody walking as far off as they can and you're constantly going by that spot and you're looking for a heart that's ready to come back home. That's a picture of God's heart towards you and me. His father saw him and he what? I mean, he ran out there and slapped him around he ran out there and said, I told you before you left how you should have acted and you should have, should have done and you should have just done this always. Uh, he could have said all of those things and would he have been justified? He absolutely would have. Again, Jesus has given us a picture of the Father's heart. He saw him from afar off and he ran to him. 
compassion. He embraced him. I mean, literally the picture is somebody just only bear hug tackling you and burying their face in your neck and kissing on you and so glad to see you. Uh, in, in fact, they, the people of this time, even when they would use some of these words, in, in fact, uh, the Syrian and Arabic translations would not even use the word ran in that because it's so distasteful for a Middle Eastern man to run, uh, to, to have his garment up, to actually see a portion of his, of his legs. I mean, they would have just gone, I mean, this guy has lost it. I mean, and so to, to give this example of God's heart that this is somebody that's totally uh, and completely not going to just come and grab you, it'd be like grabbing your kids and just going, I love you. I I love you. I love you. I want you. It's okay. Daddy's here. Daddy's here. That's a picture of God's heart. And maybe in talking to God in prayer, you need to be reminded of God's heart for you. Oh yeah. Of God's heart for you. He's not going, you did this again? And you said that again? And you thought that again? And you keep coming to back with me to that again? And know yet, when you turn back to God's heart in repentance and run towards home, he embraces you with loving embrace. James 4, 8, draw near to God and he draws near to you. Maybe you need to be reminded, folks, beloved, that God is ready to engage with you in prayer. To talk heart to heart in prayer. He ran to him and he embraced him. You notice that he, he, he didn't even get a chance to say, I'm sorry, uh, you know, I shouldn't have done all of this and I was wrong and you were right. He doesn't even get a chance. Why? Because the father is just embracing him with love. What does his heart need at that moment? What would overwhelm everything else at that moment? God's love for him. And he stopped seeing himself as he was and all this and he was just embraced and the father's love for him in that moment. Maybe you just be, need to be reminded of God's, God's love for you. Reminds me, okay, flashback to the 80s. If you were there, then good on you. Uh, you know, that's when all the good songs were. Uh, you know, and, and one of the songs back, back then was uh, Benny Hester's when, when God Ran. Did you, you, anybody? Okay, thanks. Thanks, didn't leave me alone. Uh, and it's just this beautiful picture of, you know, all this going on, and it just comes back to this course of just God ran. Did he have to? No. He didn't have to. He chose to. Why? Because he loves you, even in your current condition. Wow. Remember, there's two sons, though, right? We, we call it the prodigal of the... A parable of the prodigal son, and we're just thinking of one son. But there's actually how many sons? Two. And there's actually two sons and two conditions of the heart presented here. And if you just look at the one and celebrate the one, you know, yeah, I was lost, I found, I came back, you missed part of the story. There's two sons here. And so, yes, it's beautiful if you've got somebody that just totally runs away from God and then totally wakes up to God and embraces back. That's beautiful. But there's another extreme that Jesus presented here. There's another extreme that Jesus presented here as it continues on in verse 22. Now I'm going to jump back for a second. I got all riled up. I'm going to jump back for a second. I don't want to miss something that's very important. We saw that the father jumped and he ran. And in verse 21 through 24, uh, I, I don't want to miss this. Um, the son said to the father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to call, be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring the best robe. Now to wrap your mind around this, this would have been that robe that would have been for the greatest of celebrations, probably for the wedding of the oldest son. Okay. Bring the best robe and put it on this guy. Yeah. Put it, put the best robe on. On, on, on this guy and, and put it on him and put a ring on his hand, which was the symbol of the, the family and shoes on his feet. The only ones that wore shoes at the time were the father and the sons. So put shoes on his feet 
and bring the fatted calf. Now, this wouldn't be just let's throw some steaks on. This would have been uh, something that was specifically set aside and prepared for the greatest of feasts, and there was no preservation, and so this wouldn't be, let's throw on a couple of steaks for just us. This would be, let's invite the town and have the biggest party you've ever seen. My son is home. For this was my son. He was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they begin to celebrate. I needed to jump back and just remind you, what's the Father's heart for you? When you turn back, when you engage in prayer, it's like, yes! He's ready to celebrate. Who was the party for? Oh, for the son. What did the son do? Nothing. What did the father do? Remember, you're going to get a picture of the father's heart. What did the father do? Oh, he showered him with love. He showered him with mercy. He showered him with grace. And he didn't deserve any of it. This was a celebration of the Father's heart. Come to the party. This is a celebration of the Father's heart. And the Son, just like everybody else, why was he in celebration? Because he had nothing to bring and he got everything. Thank you, God. It's a picture of the Father's heart. When you... If you know Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you go to heaven, you're not going to be celebrating the next person who comes in. When you get there, you're going to be celebrating Jesus. Thank you. And when somebody else comes in, you're not going to go, oh, we're going to celebrate you. No, you're going to go, let's celebrate Jesus. Woohoo! Why? Because the party is about him. All glory and honor is to him. That's a taste of the Father's heart for you. He embraced him for you. He throws the party for you. Yeah, who's all glory is it? It's nothing about you. There's nothing that can compare to Almighty God. We can't give an equal representation we can only just give pieces why because he is all that he created all we see he created all we hear and feel and touch it's it's like the paint trying to describe the canvas it's there's it's impossible that's a picture of the father's heart now i get back on track remember there were two kids to the story there was the younger son and he said no and he ran away but then there was the older son There was the older son. When he heard about the younger son coming back, you know what he did? Yeah. Oh, he got his grumpy on. He got his angry. He was like, he did all that. He wasted all that. And he went and did all all of that. Nothing to do with him. In fact, if you see the older son's heart, again, We're getting a picture. If you see the older son's heart, he throws a little temper tantrum, doesn't he? He, He's like, I've been here doing all the right things. I've followed all the rules. I've done everything. And you didn't even throw a party for me. Why? I'm not going into his party. I'm not going into his party. Why? Because you didn't notice me and I've been doing all these things. Just like maybe you and I have abandoned God and done our own thing, and maybe you've known the joy of turning back to Him in repentance, this also talks about the other extreme of our heart. We can say, I've done it all to to God, and I've followed all the rules, uh, and we can kind of come to God like we are owed it. And is that any better? No. We're going to miss out on the party. We can follow all the rules and we can be all religious and we can do all the things and we can miss the Father's heart for us. And, and don't miss this, but wh- what did the Father do? Get a taste of Jesus. Just like he ran, went out and embraced the Son from a long way off, he went out into the field and he grabbed a hold of the, younger, the older son and he said, all I have is yours. Come and be reconciled to me and your brother and come on in. What's interesting, Jesus just leaves the story at that. And you're like, I wonder what they're going to do. 
Because, I mean, we want the resolution, don't we? We want, like, so what do they do? I mean, a great end of the story would be, you know, the son, the older son just goes, oh, you're right, Father. You know, let's go celebrate. Let's have a family hug and a family pick, and that, that would be great. That's part of what our heart wants it. And believe me, that's what God's heart wants for each of us, whether you're on the far extreme of needing repentance or you've just been holding on in the things that you've done and trying to earn God's acceptance and favor. Regardless of where you are, God wants it to be reconciled, but he left it open. He left the story open for a reason. For those that were listening. And what were so many of those that were listening? Remember those were the sinners and the tax collectors on one side, and many of them came to know Christ. They repented, and they found glory and celebration of heaven. They joined in what was going on. Guess you are God. But many, if not most, of those Pharisees who were just priding themselves on doing the right thing and were around it and said they were always there, did they get in on the celebration of heaven? Actually, Scripture continues to tell us that they were the ones who grabbed the piece of wood and they beat our Savior and they put him on the cross and did not accept the love of the Father. Ouch. What can we learn about talking to God in prayer? A couple of things. We're not talking to an uptight, boring, disengaged God in your mind see a loving father now maybe not your father because you you know maybe you go man if I start doing that things go bad quick no 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 I'm talking about perfection I'm not talking about something you compare something to somebody else or you go this is a happy grandfather no 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 see God for who he is how can we know Oh, we hear Scripture, the inspired Word of God, and we see the Father's heart for us. That we, when we lean in, He wants to engage right where we are. We're not talking to an upright, rule-obsessed, boring God. When, we're, when we pray, we're talking to a Father that rewards those who turn to Him in repentance, that come home. In fact, the greatest thing you can do today if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that you'd confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, Romans 10, 9. And that you would move from death to life, that you would own a relationship with him and that you would begin meeting with him. That you would begin meeting in, with him until he takes you home. Maybe God, by the power of his spirit, just brought you here and you go, there's that thing. I don't have to call that thing out. There's that thing that's going on with you that you came in here, and if we were to be honest, your heart's weighed down. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, he just reminds you, you need to lay that down today. You don't have to come, you don't have to leave with that suitcase that you brought. You see what I'm saying? The beautiful thing of being encouraged and being in the middle of God's people together and God's family is you don't have to leave with what you came with. And all those burdens and all those lockups in your heart, God would say, bring that to me. And before you even get a word out of your mouth, you can feel the embrace and the love of the Father that's coming to just surround you and envelop you with Almighty God loving you. Maybe that's what you need to hear today. When we pray, we're talking to a Father who is ready to greet you with compassion and love and mercy, and grace. How do you know? Scripture over and over reminds us of the truth. Remember, Jesus was telling us this so we would get a taste of the Father's heart. When we pray, when we talk to God, do we have to say it out loud? If you know Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit is a deposit within you, and he can even hear the groans of your heart when you can't even put it into words. Don't you talk different to someone you're in a relationship with? I mean, you know, if someone I'm in a relationship with, I can, I can just, you know, I cannot say much at all, and I can send them an emoji. And, and, and they know, I know where you're at right now. 
I mean, they totally know. Why? Because we've just spent time together. And sometimes there's this big long conversation, uh, and sometimes it's an emoji. Are both okay? Sometimes we overcomplicate this prayer thing a little bit, don't we? And we let the world and our busyness and our distraction keep us from engaging and talking with a father who is madly in love, pursuing you even in this moment right now. And he wants your heart fully his. Why? Because he created you. He formed you. And you will only be complete and filled when you surrender all to him. And you engage in his purposes and his plans. And if you do, my, my God said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. No, no, no. But I have come that you might have life and you can have it to the fullest. Yes, that's where I want to live. Come on. This morning, I just want to remind you of the joy of God's presence and that God comes ready when you engage with him to celebrate. Ready to celebrate. Here's what I'm going to do to, today. I'm going to ask the band to come forward. And uh, as they, they get ready, uh, I, I'm going to give you a chance. You know, it's one thing to talk about prayer. It's another to talk with God in prayer. And so I would be missing out if, if I just led you to talk about and you could agree and you could say, yeah, I agree, I agree. No, 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 no. Before we leave, I'm going to give you an opportunity to talk with God in prayer. Be before you lose the, the feeling and the reminder that he places on you through the Holy Spirit and Scripture, that he wants to draw near to you, would you engage with him now, I remind you, many of us kind of fall back on maybe a rope prayer or a ritual prayer, and these are beautiful, and they have a great reminder. In fact, the disciples, as they gathered around Jesus in Luke chapter 11, Matthew chapter 6, they, they asked Jesus, of all things, they didn't say, how can we heal? How can we better uh, do this? How can we better preach? How can we better share? How can we better sing? Of only thing we see in Scripture, they ask him, how can we do this? I said, teach us how to pray. Why? Because when they were around Jesus, they saw a power in prayer that they were just blown away by. And then they saw the fruits from it. And they just what? like, you know, of all the things, man, I need more prayer. And so they're begging him, teach me how to pray. And so Jesus says, well, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. Easy for me to say, to temptation, but deliver us from evil. And you go, where's the last part? And what Jesus told them, it's not there. Doxology in 1 Chronicles 29, 11, not Jeremiah 29, 11, 1 Chronicles 29, 11, you get a taste of, of just celebration. And the doxology was like, that was so good. And just somebody stands up and go, let's praise. And the, thine is the king. And, and you had to have something, too, for the lady who sings at the wedding, you know, that goes real high, you know, at the end. Uh, and, and, and so they, they end it with this, this declaration of praise. And yet, God's not measuring us, did we pray that prayer? What is he measuring? What is he looking at? Your heart, you from the inside out. That's why I want to challenge you here in just a moment that you would take a moment and just pray. That you would praise. That you would have a moment where in reverence and all, you just go, yes, God, you're all that. Thank you for the picture in you. And you just use your words. And you just tell God what you're thankful for and what you've seen and what you've experienced, even what you, you know in Scripture. Just tell him, praise him. Don't focus on anything else. Just praise him in your words. And then repent. What does that mean? Just look in your heart and say, Holy Spirit, is there anything that's not right with you, God? Anything. Anything. Whether you said it, talked it, anything that comes up, you just make it right. And God will have a way of all those suitcases and baggages and things that you brought in here. He will do this. That's what repentance is. I'm going to change my heart. I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to bring it to you. I'm going to say I'm sorry. And then instead of holding on to this, I'm going to hold on to you. That's what repentance is. So you pray, you, you praise, you repent, and then you ask, whatever's on your heart, whatever. If it doesn't roll off your tongue to God, then it probably doesn't need to keep going. 
Ask him. What if it's a big ask? Ask him. Yeah, he may say yes and he may say, child, come on now. <laughs> you know, I've given you, you know, all this candy, you know, and, I'm a, you know, and, and, and is, is there a place for both of it? Yes. So ask him. And then finally, yield. What do you mean by that? Remind yourself. He doesn't need to be reminded. Remind yourself who's the king. Surrender your heart to him. Surrender your finances to him and your money to him and your dreams to him and your finances to him and, and your responsibilities to him and whatever it is, you yield. You say, this is yours. That's what yield looks like. Can you do that? You go, I can do that. I can do that P-R-A thing, Y thing. Let's not just talk about it. Let's talk with him. So we're going to pray, play, pray, pray. We're going to play a song and this is your moment to pray. Words are not going to be up on the screen. We're just going to keep this up. We're going to sing over you. And this is your opportunity for freedom to happen in this place. For God to have a chance to celebrate another life that turns to him. That someone that just decides to repent and come home. For somebody that goes, no, no, I'm not going to stand like this any longer. I'm going to break it down here and I'm going to bring it up here. I mean, we need to leave in freedom today. How do we do that? Through talking to God in prayer. So here in just a moment, it's going to be your time. How does that look like? You can stay where you are. You can come use the steps. But this song would be your time to pray. And then I'm going to just ask you, could you do this this week? Could you just try this once a day between now and next week? That's all. No, I mean, not 27 times. Um, can you at least try that once a week? Well, you're like, well, I already prayed like twice a day. Well, good. Can you take one step and go three? Wherever you are, would you just go, I'm going to do that. Uh, and, and I'm not worried about how long you pray or what those words are. Why? Because God is looking to your heart. You're, you may be done in second. That's fine as long as your heart's surrendered towards the master. Would you take this time right now? D. R-A-Y. This is going to be your time. This is going to be your time. Let me pray for you as you stand up and then we're going to start singing. Stand up. God, I pray that you would be honored and glorified in this time together. That you would see the hearts of your people. God, thank you that you celebrate those hearts that are turned towards you. I just pray your spirit would move in this place. Because only you change things by the power of your word. You change things. God, would you allow us to walk in your freedom? Thank you for a taste of your heart. Would you be blessed and honored and glorified by this time as we sing? I pray that people would not just talk about prayer, but talk with you in prayer. God, draw us closer for your glory. And we say in advance, God, we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. This is your time.